Today's scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn there and follow along. If you do not have your Bibles with you, you can follow along on the screen beside me. That's Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Receive now God's word. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let me just begin by reminding you where we are in the overall flow of the narrative in the book of Mark. Uh, Beginning with chapter 11, we had entered into the third and final act of this gospel, as well as the final week of Jesus' life. We are now in the Passion Week of the Christ. And this finale kicked off with two very dramatic and public acts. First, as he approached the city of Jerusalem, Jesus rode in on an unbroken colt or donkey, in fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies of Zechariah chapter 9. The crowd, full of excitement and expectation from the previous two miracles, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, as well as the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Uh, the crowds were spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Luke tells us in his version of the triumphal entry that there were some Pharisees in the midst of that crowd. And hearing the people's chant, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. To which Jesus replied, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So from the very beginning, whilst the crowd was overcome with joyous ecstasy, the religious leaders were provoked to jealous envy. Second, upon entering into the city, Jesus headed straight into the the temple, the very heart of Jerusalem and of Judaism. And seeing the merchants and the money changers conducting their business within the court of the Gentiles, Jesus, being filled with righteous indignation, drove them all out and prevented anyone from carrying anything through the temple courts. And then once again, before the audience of the massive Passover crowd, Jesus denounced the temple as a den of robbers, an allusion to Jeremiah chapter 7, a passage which in its original context was a judgment that spelled out the physical destruction of the first temple, the the temple of Solomon. And then Mark chapter 11, verse 18, in it we read that the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. Starting with the very next passage, then Jesus is confronted with a barrage of delegates from the Sanhedrin, the official seat and highest authority of the religious establishment. And in each case, we see Jesus' opponents trying to carry out exactly what we were just told. They're seeking for a way to destroy him. First, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and asked asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Of course, they already knew the answer to those questions. It was by God's authority. Jesus had made made that clear throughout his ministry. But you see, this delegate wanted Jesus to explicitly make this claim so that they could charge him of blasphemy and condemn him to death. As we shall see in Mark chapter 14, That's exactly what they will do. When Jesus stands trial before the council, the high priest questions him. Are you the Christ? And by the time we get to Good Friday, Jesus will answer his opponents directly and openly. He'll say, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And what's their reaction? Do you remember the story? 
The high priest tears his garments and he says, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. That's exactly what they will do. But it's not Good Friday yet, and Jesus does not give them the answer that they want. So in our passage, another group is sent. This time it's the Pharisees and the Herodians. And they try to trap Jesus with this question regarding taxation. Jesus evades the trap, and in verse 18, this time it's the Sadducees' turn. They bring to him a question regarding the resurrection. And they're followed by the scribes who confront him with the issue of scriptural interpretation. So one after another after another. R.T. France summarizes, The cumulative effect of this sequence of controversies is to leave the readers with the impression that Jesus is locked in combat with this coalition of the most influential people in Jerusalem. But after all is said and done, Jesus not only holds his own, but he emerges as the victor. This is the overall section that we are now in. We have a very short passage this morning, only five verses to get through. And we'll approach them under two very broad headings. First, we'll look at the trap of the Pharisees. And second, the wisdom of Christ. The trap of the Pharisees and the wisdom of Christ. But before we get into the text, let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, you sent your son uh, to die for our sins. But before he died for our sins, he lived a perfect life of obedience. And not just in this section that we are now in in Mark, but throughout his entire life, he was locked in a spiritual battle with the evil one. And yet he stood firm in the truth and in all righteousness, resisting the temptations that were sent his way, overcoming all the tests that he had to deal with. May we look upon this passage and marvel at the wisdom of Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. First of all, then, we look at the Pharisees' trap. Verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Although we're not told exactly who they are when we read, and they sent to him, considering that the subject of these plural verbs have not changed since Mark eleven twenty seven, I would say that it's fairly safe to conclude that by that pronoun they, Mark still has in view the Sanhedrin. And so the Sanhedrin sent to Jesus some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Now, earlier in Mark chapter 3, we already saw the Pharisees entering into an alliance with the Herodians in order to devise a way in which they might destroy or kill Jesus. And as I pointed out back then, this is really an unlikely alliance. You see, the Pharisees were the nationalists. They were Jews to the core. In contrast, the Herodians had sold their souls to the Romans. The Pharisees were the conservatives, practicing a hyper-legalistic religion. The Herodians were the liberals, practicing a syncretistic religion. The Pharisees represented resistance to Rome. The Herodians represented accommodation to Rome. When it came to political religious agendas, they were at opposite extremes of the spectrum. But as the saying goes, Adversity makes strange bedfellows. In other words, they may have hated each other, but there was someone else that they hated even more, namely Jesus. The Pharisees hated Jesus because he was undermining their religious credibility and religious authority. The Herodians hated him because they perceived him to be a threat to their political arrangement. So in their mutual hatred for Christ, they entered into this unholy Alliance, to devise a plot against him. This reminded me of Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's what's going on here. The rulers of the earth are taking counsel together against the Lord's anointed or the Lord's Messiah, the Christ. You know, if you think about it, there's something unusual in the level of hatred that these men harbor against Jesus. You have to hate someone with extreme intensity in order to not only want to kill that person, but to actually carry out that murderous plot. This is deep hatred. And I think Mark would have us understand that this hatred is in part being nurtured by Satan himself. I think you'll see why I'm saying that as we go through this passage. Now, this is not to excuse the Pharisees and Herodians from their actions. They are wholly responsible. But this is to point out that Satan, at this moment, has a vested interest in blinding, in manipulating, and in whispering lies into the ears of these religious leaders because through them, Satan has an opportunity to thwart and to undermine the redemptive purposes of God. Or so he thinks. So we are to see the workings of the cosmic powers, the spiritual forces of evil, as Paul puts it, standing behind this entire scene, and not just a scene, but this whole section. Well, the Sanhedrin sent the Pharisees and the Herodians, as verse 13 continues on to say, in order to trap Jesus in his talk. The verb there for trap in the Greek is agruo. It's a word that occurs only here in the New Testament. But elsewhere, it's normally used in the context of hunting or catching prey or animal for food. Not coincidentally, in several passages, Satan is described as a beast of prey. 1 Peter 5.8, for example, says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan is seeking to devour the Christ. His instruments are the Pharisees and the Herodians, and they have now come seeking to trap him or to hunt him in his tracks. The fact that they were trying to trap him in his talk or in his words suggests that they were hoping to expose Jesus as a false teacher in the eyes of the public. But before they get to their question, before they get to their trap, if you will, they begin with this flattery. Verse 14. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Have you ever been on the receiving end of flattery? Has anyone praised you for your qualities? I don't care who you are. When someone pays you generous compliments, when someone expresses their high regard for your character, it is really hard to tell that person something you know will disappoint them. And although that's in part due to the fact that you care about them, it's primarily because you care about yourself, about their opinion of you, because of your pride, because of your ego. And by the way, isn't this how the serpent approached Eve? With a certain level of flattery. Didn't he also stroke her ego, suggesting to her that she didn't need God, that she could be wise, knowing good and evil, all on her own. She just needed to break away from God's oppressive rule. Genesis tells us that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field, and that craftiness was displayed in part in the way that he manipulated Adam and Eve through flattery. There's something eerily similar going on in our passage. Before they strike, these enemies of God flatter Jesus. They try to soften his stance upon the truth to compromise his integrity. They say to him, we know that you don't care about anyone's opinion. We know that you're not swayed by appearances. That last phrase in particular is interesting. In the Greek, it literally says, for you do not look into the face of men. That's a figure of speech. It's also found in Leviticus chapter 19 within the context of the judicial court. In that passage, God instructs his people to judge someone not on the basis of literally their face, 
or their appearance. So in a corrupt, in a corrupt system, the judge would say to himself, well, let me look at who you are before I make my judgment. Oh, you're a very important person. You're a very wealthy person. I guess I'll give you a pass this time. That's the sense here. You don't make judgments by looking at someone's profile. And there's a sense of irony here, isn't there? It is actually quite silly. The Pharisees are flattering Jesus by telling him that he's a man of integrity, that he's not swayed by people, but they're flattering him in an attempt to sway him. They're saying one thing but intending another, and Jesus picks up on this immediately. In verse 15, Mark tells us that Jesus responds, knowing their hypocrisy. He's not taken by their flattery. He's not going to back down from speaking the truth, even if it gets him in trouble. And in that, there's another element of irony. Despite the insincerity of the Pharisees, what they say about Jesus is actually quite true. This is kind of an aside, but from time to time, I think it's helpful to just take a step back from this or any other passage and to appreciate the way in which that passage has been literarily crafted. Not literally crafted, but literarily crafted. Not only is our passage thick with irony, but Mark exhibits his cleverness as a writer. And I think what that does is it highlights, it enhances the cleverness of the character within the story, namely Jesus Christ. It helps the readers appreciate the wisdom of Christ. But that's our second point, and we'll get to that when we get there. Well, first comes the flattery, and after trying at least to soften up Jesus' stance, they spring the trap. Here it is. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? I really wish I was there to see the facial expression of these Pharisees and Herodians because I think they must have really thought themselves clever for having come up with this one. You can imagine them thinking to themselves, we've got him now. There's no way that he's going to get out of this one. And here's why. Here's why the question is also a trap. The first thing to point out is that the word for taxes is cane sauce. It's actually not even a Greek word. It's a transliteration of the Latin word kensus, from which we get the English word census. And that's important because the word specifically refers to the imperial poll tax, a tax that was based upon the Roman census. It was a tax that you paid simply for being a registered resident within a Roman province, in this case, within the province of Judea. Now, you have to know something about the history of this tax in order to appreciate the force of this question. It hadn't been long since that tax was first imposed. And so even in Jesus' time, this was a hot topic. According to Josephus, a Jewish historian, this is how the story goes. There was once a man by the name of Judas, not the same Judas who's part of Jesus' twelve, this man was known as Judas of Galilee, probably because he was from Galilee. He had become notorious for staging a revolt against the Roman Empire in an attempt to gain independence. Keep in mind that during the intertestamental period, that period between the Old and the New Testament, as Palestine was becoming increasingly Hellenized under the influence of first the Greeks and then the Romans, there was a lot of resistance from the Jews. And in some cases, that resistance took the form of violent insurrection. Well, Judas was part of this resistance effort. Only in A.D. 6, that's less than a generation before Jesus' time, the Roman governor Quirinius decisively stamped out Judas' revolt and he imposed a census in the Roman province of Judea and the correlated imperial poll tax. So it hasn't been that long since this tax has been imposed. So this particular tax was the immediate cause of Judas's failed revolution. And it was therefore an expression, especially from the perspective of the Jews, of Rome's oppressive control over their lives. But the story continues. 
Judas may have been eliminated, but his ideology survived. And in fact, Judas became the inspiration for what would later culminate into the zealot movement. You may be familiar with that term, the zealots, because if you remember, even one of Jesus' 12 disciples was called Simon the Zealot. This was an ideology that was alive and well in Jesus' time. As a matter of fact, it would continue on even after Jesus' life. The Zealot movement would catch on fire. It would fuel the climactic revolt of AD 66, a revolt against the Roman Empire that would end with the siege of Jerusalem. When in AD 70, the Roman general Tiberius would sweep through the city, utterly destroying everything within her walls, including Herod's temple. But let's come back to our passage. All of that undergirds this question. Is it lawful to pay the poll tax to Caesar? Even the way that that question is phrased, you can tell that there's a question behind the question. Is it lawful? Well, of course it's lawful. Roman law requires you to pay the tax. But that's not their question, is it? They're asking about God's law. In other words, their question presupposes that there is a fundamental opposition between Caesar and God. Going back to Judas of Galilee, this is what Josephus again records about him. Judas called his fellow countrymen cowards for being willing to pay tribute to the Romans and for putting up with mortal masters in place of God. You see, for the zealots, the issue wasn't just political, it was theological. To pay taxes was considered a compromise of your exclusive allegiance to the one true God. You see then how this is essentially aimed at eliciting Jesus' stance with regards to this popular political movement. They're trying to get him to state his position on this very sensitive and charged issue. And so here's the trap. If Jesus says, yes, pay the tax, then he will be discredited in the eyes of the crowd. You can imagine them booing at his answer. But if Jesus says, no, don't pay the tax, the Sanhedrin would have reason to report him to Rome as a rebel. Rome may have tolerated religious diversity, but when it came to insurrection, Rome was as ruthless as they came. Should we pay taxes or should we not? The Pharisees are waiting for him to say yes. They would love to see Jesus discredited in the eyes of the Jewish people. The Herodians are waiting for him to say no. They, they would love to see Jesus being removed from the political landscape. Either way, Jesus is about to fall. Pastor Kent Hughes writes, There was no way Jesus could escape. How delicious the prospect. How joyous their hatred. That was point number one, the trap of the Pharisees. And now point number two, the wisdom of Christ. Let's take a look at how he responds. Verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Jesus says, why put me to the test? That's how he interprets this confrontation. It's a test. The word for test comes from the verb peirazzo. It's a word that we've seen a couple of times before. Most recently, we saw it in Mark chapter 10, verse 2. And the Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? We also saw it in Mark chapter 8, verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. The very first instance of that word in this gospel occurred in Mark chapter 1, verse 13. When immediately after his baptism, Jesus was driven out into the wilderness where he was tested or tempted by Satan. As I've pointed out before, throughout his gospel, Mark portrays the religious leaders as agents of Satan. 
as an extension of his ploy to tempt Jesus, to cause Jesus to stumble. As I said before, Satan has a vested interest in seeing Jesus, the Lord's anointed, fall. And so just as he tempted the first Adam, just as he caused him to fall, and in him all of humanity, Satan is now tempting the second Adam. Because if he gets Jesus to fall, well, that's it. God's plan of redemption is thwarted, and with it, mankind is lost forever. The stakes are high. For there's a spiritual warfare that's taking place behind this earthly conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus. Bring me a denarius, Jesus says. Let me look at it. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. I think this must be one of the most brilliant answers that Jesus ever gives in all of the Gospels. The denarius was a silver coin worth about a day's wage in Palestine. On one side of the coin, there was an image of the bust or the head of Tiberius Caesar, who was the then emperor of Rome. And with it, there was a Latin inscription that read, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. Not only was there a graven image on it, but words that ought not to be attributed to any man was attributed to Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. On the reverse side of the coin, there was another image of Tiberius's mother Livia and another inscription that read Pontifex Maximus, high priest. I mean, everything about this coin, let alone the tax itself, was an offense to Jewish sensibility whether you were a zealot or not. As you can imagine, the Jews considered these coins little idols. And for everyday commerce, as well as for the temple offerings, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, the Jews were to avoid idolatry by using locally minted copper coins, coins that bore no image. But for the poll tax, they had to use this coin and this coin alone. They didn't have a choice. What does that imply? Well, apparently, Jesus and his disciples didn't have a single denarius in their possession. They didn't carry with them this little idol. But the Pharisees and the Herodians, well, they were able to produce one. And so evidently, the Pharisees in particular, who asks this question suggesting that it would be a moral compromise to pay the Roman tax, they were themselves more complicit in the system than they would have liked others to know. They are in no position to condemn Jesus for a lack of patriotism or religious purity, knowing their hypocrisy. Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. Jesus holding up the coin, asks the crowd, whose likeness and inscription is this? And the crowds eagerly answer, Caesar's. And then a hush must have fallen upon that entire throng of people as everyone now on the edge of their seats awaited his answer. What's he going to say? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And perhaps what was a shocking turn of events, Jesus says, pay the tax. This is lost in translation, but in the Greek, when the original question was posed, the Pharisees said, is it lawful to pay or to give taxes to Caesar? The word there for to pay comes from the verb didomi. But when Jesus replies, he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The verb that Jesus uses is apodidomi. There's an additional prefix in that word. It's a different word, actually. And it makes all the difference. Jesus doesn't just say, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He actually says, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You see, in ancient times, it was understood that coins were the property of the person whose image it was stamped upon. And the verb that Jesus uses capitalizes upon that assumption 
because apodidomi includes the nuance of indebtedness. Jesus is saying it's not that you're giving anything to Caesar. It's not that you're paying tribute to him. It's that you're giving back what already belongs to him. In that sense, paying the poll tax is paying back a debt. So that payment is not only permitted, but not to pay would be considered theft. From Jesus' perspective, the poll tax symbolized all the benefits that Caesar had given to the Jews. And what had Caesar, this pagan ruler, done for the Jews? Well, he had provided them with running water through the aqueducts. He had built bridges and roads for ease of transport. He had provided protection for them by the presence of his army. He had even allowed them to practice their religion in peace. I mean, they were living in an unprecedented period of peace known as the Pax Romana. This is what you would call common grace. The Jews were beneficiaries of common grace. The fact of the matter is, Rome had made life easier and more comfortable, not just for the Jews, but for all of its citizens, not too unlike what our government has done for us. And I think you can connect the dots to apply this one on your own. Pay your taxes, Jesus says. You are indebted to your government. Who could object to that kind of logic? But Jesus' answer doesn't end there. He continues on to say, and to God, the things that are God's. This is a remarkably balanced statement. By instructing the crowd to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Jesus distances himself from any form of political anarchy, best exemplified in his day by the zealots. He will not have himself associated with that popular movement, but at the same time, by juxtaposing the things of Caesar with the things of God, he asserts that Caesar is not God. And Jesus also distances himself from religious compromise in service to the empire. In other words, he has distanced himself from both the position of the Pharisees and the position of the Herodians. And he exposes the fact that the dilemma inherent in their question was in fact a false dilemma. Caesar and God are not necessarily opposed to each other. And there can be a situation in which Caesar maintains his authority over his domain without impeding upon the authority and sovereignty of God. Let me spell out the implications of that a little bit more. By this very simple statement, Jesus is acknowledging the legitimacy of human government. His reply indicates that our duties to the government do not infringe upon our duties to God. He assumes the validity of the secular state and its demands, even when that state is controlled by a man who thinks that he's a god. This is a far, far-reaching statement. It was astonishing the instant he uttered it, but even today it remains arguably the single most influential political statement ever made in history. Because Jesus' answer will shape and govern the way that the church interacts with the state for the rest of time, even today. Of course, the apostles will think through this statement a little bit more. And they will also spell out the implications for us. They will further develop Jesus' teachings. It is from this answer that we get the teachings of the Apostle Paul in both Romans 13 as well as 1 Timothy 2. It is from this answer that we get the teachings of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. Not only are we to pay taxes, but we are called to pray for, to submit to, even to honor the governing authority. I'll let you study those passages on your own. But what those passages make clear is that secular government ought to be considered a divine institution. Just as marriage, just as the family is a divine institution. So that Paul even goes as far as saying that to resist the government would be to resist God. 
See, if you confess a sovereign God, there's no such thing as the secular state. Everything in this world is sacred in that it belongs to the transcendent God of the universe. Now, we have to be careful to note what this passage is not addressing. Jesus is not addressing a situation in which the things of Caesar are in direct conflict with the things of God, in which the commands of Caesar contradict the explicit and revealed will of God in Scripture, and as alluded to above, by continuing on to instruct us to render to God the things that are God's, Jesus provides the basis from which we can, in certain circumstances, resist the state. I will also let you think about that one on your own. For today, let me move on to this concluding thought. Jesus' response does beg the question, well, we know that the things of Caesar, in part, refers to taxes, but what exactly does Jesus mean when he refers to the things of God? What are the things of God? I think you can answer that in a couple of ways. You can point to a passage such as Matthew chapter 6, which talks about storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven as opposed to treasures on earth. More immediately, you can point to Mark chapter 8. Do you remember Jesus' rebuke to Peter? When Peter tries to block Jesus' path of suffering and persecution, Jesus rebuked Peter by saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's the same phrase. It's the same contrast. I give those to you as references, but for our purposes, I'm going to be content with answering this question based upon the context of the passage itself. What are the things of God? Jesus gives us a clue as how we ought to think about this in verse 16. When he asks, Whose likeness and inscription is this? Follow Jesus' logic. The denarius belongs to Caesar because it has his likeness or his image stamped upon it. So that if you stick with that logic, then the things of God are the things that likewise bear his image. And what bears the likeness and image of God? You do. We are, if you will, each one of us a coin in God's treasury. We were made from his mint. We have his image stamped upon us. This is doubly true of the believer, for this is how Paul puts it, you were sealed with the promised spirit. You've been stamped with the seal of God, testifying that you belong to him, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is that very seal. So this is what Jesus is saying. Give the coin to Caesar, but you, you belong to me. What are the things of God? What do you owe God? Just this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. To die to yourself, to live for Christ. To pick up your cross and follow after him. Mark concludes this passage by observing that the crowds marveled at him. And if I've done my job correctly, then hopefully you're also left marveling at the wisdom of Christ. And what kind of wisdom is this? It is a wisdom that is able to withstand the barrage of temptations and tests that Satan sends Jesus' way. It is wisdom that Adam and, Adam and Eve failed to attain in the very fact that this wisdom includes with it obedience to God. But where the first Adam has failed, the second Adam, Christ, has succeeded. So that by the outpouring of his spirit of wisdom, all those who believe and trust in him are also enabled to resist the temptations of the evil one and come out victorious in Christ Jesus. And so let's walk away this morning reflecting, marveling, at the wisdom of God in the way that he's manifested it throughout this universe, 
even in our own lives. Let's pray. O wise God, the creator of the universe, not just creator, but sustainer, you who sustains all things towards the end that you have designed for it. We marvel not just at this passage and the wisdom of Christ to overcome this test, but we marvel at your redemptive purpose of sending your Son to be incarnate in flesh, to live a life of obedience, to die on the cross. Only you would have come up with such a wise plan to be resurrected from the grave, to ascend, to pour out his spirit, and to impart upon us the very wisdom that Adam and Eve failed to attain. And so that by giving us the wisdom of Christ, we might also attain to eternal life. What marvel that is. Father, help us continue to reflect upon this text. Help us continue to see your wisdom in all of creation and to exalt you and to praise you, and to live according to that spirit of wisdom in our lives. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.